Everybody, big and warm welcome. Thank you for being here this evening. Uh, thank you for your interest in this conference. My name is Laurent Mieville. I'm the director of the Technology Transfer Office Unitech. And uh, we are here to not only celebrate our 20th anniversary, but also to thank all the actors and partners of the ecosystem that make this technology transfer true. And I'm very glad that we see uh, many people tonight, many friends, many colleagues. And so it's a very nice for me to open this uh, conference. And um, I just want to give a, a few information about Unitech for those of you who don't know what Unitech is. And then I will give the word to the guest speakers that will uh, go on with the conference. So I just uh, quickly will cover in few slides what Unitech is doing and what are our, I would say, uh, success, if we can say success in the last 20 years. So Unitech has four main activities. You can see on that slide, the first one, the most important one, is to do what we call valorization, which is technology transfer. The second one is very important, it's training. We have a lot of uh, possibility to get people more confident about what is technology transfer, especially the student and the people from the university and the University Hospital of Geneva. We also run a proof of concept fund, which allow to uh, support research uh, up to 30,000 Swiss francs to uh, actually take a discovery and develop it further, hopefully to get a success in technology transfer with a license at the end. And finally, the events, this is one of them. Uh, for our 20th anniversary, we have a series of events. I will just close my presentation quickly on another one. But uh, this is very important for us to also, of course, network, meet you, meet other colleagues or partners or investors. And this is part of what we do. Now, in terms of numbers, I, I won't spend a lot of time, but just want to want to give you a bit of a taste of what happened in the last 20 years of uh, activities of Unitech. We just uh, went beyond the 1,000 inventions that were disclosed by researchers to Unitech and evaluated. Among them, there is 350 that are still active and we are working on them. Out of these inventions, 200, more than 250 inventions were filed as a patent applications. And we work also with outside patent attorneys. Some of them are here tonight. Thank you for this also uh, very important support for us. Out of these 250 patents, 150 have been granted. So that's also good news for us. That means we have a strong intellectual property portfolio. And of course, the goal is to actually transfer these discoveries to companies. And these more than 150 licenses are also the signs for me, the most important sign is the one of a success, meeting, convincing, and negotiating, and concluding agreements with private partners. Out of these licenses, we got about 7.3 million Swiss francs back, which is split among the researcher, the group, and the university, and the hospital. And out of that, and this is also very important, we have 45 uh, spin-offs. You will, you will have a few uh, examples tonight. And this is very important for us also to help people develop and launch new ventures and create jobs and hopefully uh, have an impact later on. The last number, it's most important for me, is the number of private investment in the area based on spin-offs and I think this is a key number for me. It's not the, the money that we, is flowing in to the university. It's the money that is flowing in the region, the ecosystem. And these 800 million Swiss francs, they help to, to create jobs. They help to buy equipment, uh, launch st startup. So I think it's, for me, it's the most important number in these 20 years. Just to give you what's going on in Switzerland, I won't also spend too much time on that. There are only two ranking I know of technology transfer in countries, and Switzerland is very well uh, placed right now. One ranking is IMD, the other one is the World Economic Forum. 
Um, I'm not saying we are the best, and we have guests from USA and Israel. They're also very well ranked. I think Switzerland is among the top five, clearly. And I think it's also linked to the success, not only of university, Unitech, the researcher, but also the ecosystem. If you just look back in question of time, I made this graph this morning quickly. This, this is exactly the same ranking that you saw on the left before, but just in a matter of time. So you see the evolution of Switzerland, Israel, and USA. I took three countries. And you see that Switzerland started a bit like 10, 11, 12, and slowly but surely made his way to the top. And I think uh, I'm very happy tonight we have three representatives of top countries in technology transfer rankings. Just to finish up my presentation, I said it's a thank you. It's a thank you for the ecosystem, and I'm happy you are here tonight. And we organized a few months ago a special event for the students, because also it's very important for us to train and to encourage students to be creative. And what you see here is a series of pictures of people, students that are involved in entrepreneurship in, at the university. And we wanted to thank them of this effort, and I'd like also to acknowledge the work of Manon, who is on the back with the photos apparat. Manon, can you just wave? She made the project real by making this picture of these 100 students. And I think it's very important when you are in university to realize the importance of the creativity of the students. And we hope in the future these students will become entrepreneurs, and maybe in 20 years I won't be here, but they will be in the room, and maybe my successor will also acknowledge their work. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward for this conference. And I will give the word to Mary for her presentation about Stanford Ecosystem. Thank you. I have to put the mic really far down. <laughs> At least you guys can see me over the podium. I've gone to speak many places where I have to stand on a box because people can't see me and you have a laptop there. So this is quite nice. Um, OK, I'm Mary Albertson. I work um, in the Office of Technology Licensing at Stanford University. And I'm also the immediate past president of Autumn. How many of you know what Autumn is? Awesome. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Stanford and how its growth has been related to Silicon Valley's growth. It's a pretty brief description, but hopefully it'll give you an idea. So in 1950, Silicon Valley didn't even exist. Um, the area that's now considered Silicon Valley was mostly orchards, fruit orchards. But in 1951, Varian leased a building in Stanford's industrial park, and this is generally considered the birth of Silicon Valley. Um, the term wasn't used in publication until 1971, although people were using it um, commonly. So an important person is Fred Mc Frederick Terman. Um, he and Wallace Sterling have been called by a lot of people the fathers of Silicon Valley. Um, Wallace Sterling was the president of Stanford from 1949 to 1968. And Frederick Terman was both a dean of the School of Engineering and a provost. So together, they set up this program, the University Honors Cooperative Program. This was basically a program that allowed engineers who were already at companies to come back and take some courses so they could stay abreast of whatever the latest research was. But it also allowed the staff to understand what was going on in the companies. And this is really a cornerstone of Stanford's entrepreneurial philosophy. They really want their faculty to stay connected um, with the companies in the area. And they, he founded the first industrial park. Um, it's now called Stanford Research Park. But you'll see in a little bit what the size of that is and who, um, who is involved in that. And just to give an idea of how much of an impact he had on Silicon Valley, at one point he was mentoring half of the grad students in electrical engineering. And even once um, Bill Hewlett left and formed Hewlett Packard, he would come back frequently to bounce ideas off of um, Frederick. So the objectives of Wallace and Frederick were to recruit top tier faculty in targeted disciplines, recruit top-tier graduate students 
and have them stay in the area, creating this intellectual um, pool, and then to bring high tech, and to keep them there, they had to have companies, so they wanted to bring high tech industry into the area to hire those graduating students to participate in research collaborations because, again, they really thought it was important for industry to stay tied with the university um, to support and participate in industrial affiliates programs. And an industrial affiliates program is a program where companies pay money and they basically get early access to technology. They go to conferences and things. But they also get access to the graduate students who hopefully they'll hire later. Um, sponsor research. They always like money for research. And to provide consulting work for the faculty. And this is a different philosophy than some universities. Um, Stanford likes it when the faculty spend part of their time tied to industry. And then obviously as a source of gifts and donations, um, the university don't take money any way they can get it. So this is a comparison between 1950 and 2018. And I think you'll have access to these. I'm not gonna read through all of them, but a couple numbers that are particularly interesting is if you look at the number of graduates, there were about 2,800 in 1950. And then in 2018, there were over 9,000. And looking at the faculty number, it's grown from 370 to just over 2,000. The last number I want to point out is the sponsored research at the bottom. It went from 11 million to our current $1.64 billion in sponsored research. And since this is where we get all of our technologies, um, most of which are transferred with the grad students, it's increased so significantly that we are a, a big presence in Silicon Valley as far as a source of um, technologies. Oh, I should say too that most of that sponsored research, more than 80% is government sponsored research. So the Silicon Valley today is over 1,800 square feet, square miles, square feet, and has a population of about 3 million. The average annual earnings of somebody who works there is $131,000, but the median home price is $968,000. So one of the biggest problems we have is keeping people in Silicon Valley and recruiting people to Silicon Valley because of the cost of living. There's a lot of good technology there, but you have to be able to afford to live. Um, there are thousands of high-tech companies located there. This next number I find pretty impressive, $24.9 billion of VC investment in the area. That includes Silicon Valley and San Francisco. So Stanford Research Park, the original purpose was to earn income, but that was revised pretty quickly to reflect what Stanford was trying to do, which is place R&D focused companies near Stanford. So it was started in 1951 with 209 acres, and as I mentioned before, the first tenant was Varian. Soon after, Shockley Transistor and Hewlett Packard um, came, and Hewlett Packard is still there. Talking a little bit about the growth, you can see over the years the number of companies increased to 40 companies. They doubled the acreage, and then in 85 there were over 100 companies. Um, you can see the last two bullets talk about revenue. Stanford gained some revenue from this with rent and things, and then um, Palo Alto was pretty happy because in taxes and things like that, they made money too. The benefits that they were touting to people who would come here is access to Stanford University's students, proximity to venture capital. There's a bunch of venture capital on Page Mill Road, which isn't far from here. Sustainable buildings and, believe it or not, the Palo Alto weather. Some people like to move there because of the weather. We don't have snow there, so I'm all excited about the snow. It's unique. The research park today has 150 companies, which is basically the limit currently, and 23,000 employees. 700 acres, so that increased again. And then the industry is really diverse. It goes from electronics to biotech to law firms, so we have a lot of different people there. Um, a list of tenants that are there, you see Hewlett Packard is still there, Tesla's there, VMware. So talking about all this technology transfer in its various ways, students through our office, um, faculty consulting, what is the point? And the point is impact. What impact does this technology make? 
And you can see there's over 40,000 active companies that can trace their roots back to Stanford. This is not obviously just founding companies. That's only a small percentage. It's faculty consulting on people's scientific advisory boards and students, which again is the number one way we transfer technology. More than 5.4 million jobs and $2.7 trillion in annual world, world revenues. These are numbers that are pretty hard to get, but they've done some um, particular surveys where they feel confident in them. These last numbers I found when I was researching for this talk to be really interesting. I wouldn't thought they would be so high. But of the Stanford faculty and alumni, 29% reported being entrepreneurial, 32% have been investors, early employees, or board members on a startup. And that's a really high number. And then the last, of those who became entrepreneurs, 55% chose Stanford due to the entrepreneurial environment. So this is 55% of those who said they were entrepreneurs in the pool of alumni and faculty. So three factors of success at Silicon Valley, the technical, social, and educational infrastructure, the capital sources, and the intellectual pool of talent. So how do we help our entrepreneurs at Stanford? There's the Stanford Entrepreneurship Network, which has 43 different programs. And there's a few listed up here. But I'll talk a little bit about the first one, Biodesign. And this is a year-long course focused on medical devices. And they have teams. And the teams have a variety of people. They're scientific people. They're um, doctors. They're people from the business school. And they try to get a mix on each team. And what they do is they go out to practicing physicians and ask them, what problem do you have that needs a solution? They do needs assessment. When they get an idea of a solution that they want to work with, they come back with that and do market research, build a prototype, and things like that. They also file a provisional application. And at the end of this year, they have to give a pitch to VC about, if I formed a company, what would it look like and why should you fund it? Um, actually, there's a fair number of these students who do want to start companies. So they come to us at that point. Um, they've already filed a provisional, and we talk about what we're going to do with that and then um, terms for a potential license. The Stanford Presidential Venture Fund, the only involvement that my office has with that is that in our license agreements, we actually have to include a clause that says the Presidential Venture Fund can invest up to 10% in any funding round. So, so far, they've funded every startup that we've done um, a license with, but they don't have to. And then this academic venture exchange, AVX, is really interesting. This has turned out to be um, pretty cool. There's 12 universities who participate, and basically it's a database that has a list of entrepreneurs who are looking for opportunities, and very early stage startups or technologies that the universities have where they're looking for a management team. So then those are matched up. The entrepreneurs can look at the opportunities or you can proactively look for an entrepreneur. And I have a company, a startup company, where the faculty wanted to start a company. He didn't have a management team. He didn't really know what to do. We didn't want to license him because we didn't know if he was going to have any success. He got paired with one of the entrepreneurs on this um, database, and he got hired as the CEO, and he is still the CEO. They've had, I don't know what their success rate in, but they've had a pretty good success rate in matching people up. Oh, and then our office, which I forgot to mention. Um, our involvement isn't in starting the companies, it's in licensing them technology, but we try when we're doing our license agreements to make them fit the fact this is a very early stage technology and a very early stage company. Unlike many universities, we don't proactively help them. We don't write business plans, we don't introduce them to VC or anything like that. We are in an environment where there are so many people who are good at writing business plans and good at um, having a network of VC and good at making a pitch deck. So we just let people in the environment handle that part and we stick to the licensing. Oops. I don't know what I did. 
So to talk a little bit about my office, um, our philosophy, the first thing we look at is transferring the technology for society's benefit. You'll notice the first thing on here isn't making money. We would like to make money, but that's not what we're in this for. We want to see the technology get out there and get developed. So that's part of doing what's best for the technology, and this means when you're talking about doing a license, you have to assess who is best able to develop the technology, and can you split up fields of use and things like that to get more than one company working on it. And then do as many good deals. What this means is doing deals where you've picked a licensee who can develop the technology, also that you hope to get good revenue if they ever make a product, so you negotiate a good earned royalty, and you try and make it as broadly available as possible. So we try and do a lot of deals. We don't ask for the most money. We've never, I shouldn't say never. It would be very rare for us to walk away from a deal because of the money. Um, we try and make it work. And this is because, as my former boss said, we're planting seeds. We have to do a whole bunch of these licenses. We can't predict which ones are going to be big winners. So we have to do a lot of licenses and do them in such a way that we're helping industry make success. So these are our statistics for last fiscal year. We made just over $45 million in revenue. This is compared to 50,000 in 1970. Our office was founded in 1970. We signed 157 licenses last year as compared to three in 1970. But the number that might be interesting is to look that we did half of these were non-exclusive licenses. That means half of these licenses had to do with technologies that were biological material or tool technology, something that somebody would use to make a product. Um, people are usually surprised at this, but those aren't our, in the most part, aren't our big money makers, although we do fine with some of them. We did 36 exclusive ones and then 41 option agreements. Most of our option agreements are to startup companies that don't, they're very early stage, so they don't necessarily have funding yet, they may not have a management team. So we do an option with them that says for six months we won't license the technology. They have to meet some kind of diligence requirement. So if they tell me they're gonna raise $2 million in six months, I put in there, if you raise $2 million in six months, you can then negotiate a license agreement. So 41 options is a lot, and like I said, most of those are gonna be startups. A lot of them will never end up executing a license because the company will disband in the first six months. 22 startups, again, these are not ones we proactively started, and the number is definitely low compared to other universities. Um, we don't have an economic development mandate, which is basically part of the reason why we don't actively start companies. These are companies that came to us and, and wanted a license. So I want to talk a little bit about equity. We take equity in our startups, and a lot of people um, at other universities really push getting equity, more equity than we do. You can see we only made a million dollars in um, equity cash out last fiscal year. And I say only because we made $41 million in cash royalties. And compare this to the research budget of the university, it's $1.64 billion. So our little $1 million, as far as the university is concerned, doesn't move the needle at all. $404 million cumulatively from equity, a big chunk of that, about 336 million, was from Google. So we have other statistics that say without Google. So 68 million, I mean, we like to count Google, but 68 million for non-Google equity, 1.55 billion in cumulative cash royalties. So is it really about the money? When we take equity, we don't, we have a little bit of faith, but we don't count on the fact that equity is going to be worth anything. In some cases, it's not worth anything for a very long time. Um, I did a deal 10 years ago. They didn't have an exit until recently, and we made $14.6 million off of it, which is a lot, but it took 10 years. So this is a slide. These are sobering statistics we use with our inventors. Often they come to us and they want to get rich off of their invention. We patent about half of the inventions that we get, and we license about 25%. Of that 25%, a lot of those are non-exclusive, though, so not necessarily big money makers. 
We had 813 inventions that made some kind of income last fiscal year, but sometimes we get a check for $200. I mean, it's, a lot of them are insignificant. Of those 813, if you skip to the bottom, only seven of those inventions generated over a million dollars. Our royalty distribution policy is that we take 15% off the top and the remainder is divided into thirds. The inventors get one third, which they split amongst themselves. The departments get one third and the school that the department is in gets one third. So for a lot of these, if they're making $10,000, by the time it gets divided up for the inventors, it's really not a significant amount of money. They'll take it, but. So basically, to summarize, um, Stanford University and Silicon Valley grew up together. I think you saw from some of the statistics, things really um, jumped over the years since 1950 when Silicon Valley was started. Stanford's entrepreneurial philosophy has been an integral part of Silicon Valley's success. Having the um, scientific know-how that Stanford has, the faculty that we have, working in concert with companies um, has proved to be a huge success. OTL, what my office does, is a very modest part of the whole technology transfer. We're appreciated by the university, but as the last bullet says, our biggest source of technology transfer is really the students. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. My name is Gil granot -Meyer. I'm the CEO of IEDA, which is the technology transfer arm of the Weizmann Institute. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to talk to you, and thank you, uh, Lorraine, for the invitation, and Unitech, uh, congratulations for the 20th anniversary. Uh, we are celebrating this year our 60th anniversary, so IEDA is, uh, has been around for 60 years and it is uh, a separate company which is actually being uh, facilitating the technology transfer out of the Weizmann Institute. Uh, so um, I'm going to take a, a bit different uh, approach here and I'm gonna probably provide you with some details and numbers about the Israeli ecosystem. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna touch upon the Global Competitive Index which I think uh, gives us some insights about uh, uh, the different economies, and I'll focus obviously on, on Israel. Uh, then I'll, I'm going to brag about the Israeli uh, uh, academia, academia excellence, uh, uh, and specifically about the Weizmann Institute. Um, but I think I want to convey the message that uh, um, high-level education and uh, very good science is also one key driver for uh, a vibrant ecosystem for innovation. Uh, and then I'm gonna focus on the life science sector in Israel, uh, talk about some of our, of our challenges, and then go and talk about the opportunities or uh, the future of that uh, sector. So, um, obviously when you talk about Israel and you wanna review the ecosystem in Israel, there are several players that are key in the ecosystem in Israel. Uh, it's known that we are leading in the ICT sector. This sector is mainly built from the uh, uh, army and the people that graduate the uh, top elite units in the army. So uh, that's a big driver here. Uh, academia plays a big role in, in a lot of uh, the technology transfer and also the creation of uh, new intellectual property. We have a large community of startups uh, built over and a kind of culture uh, we've been branded as the startup nation, and uh, it it's flows and it's part of the uh, kind of ambience and culture. Uh, people holding, you know, usual positions uh, and not starting their own venture are considered to be crazy or uh, risk taking, which is uh, really the opposite normally. Uh, we have private funding, uh, growth companies, uh, multinationals companies. Uh, this is a big player in Israel. We have about uh, 400 multinationals present in Israel. I'm going to talk about the deficiency of such uh, players, uh, multinational players in the life science uh, sector. 
and the government. The government has played and is playing a very big role in pushing some uh, technologies going further. Uh, the ICT was, uh, the sector was pushed by the government, and the government is seeking now new, uh, actually new drivers of uh, innovation in Israel. Uh, I'm presenting here some, some index of uh, uh, high-tech index taken from the Israeli Innovation Authority. This is uh, a part of the government, uh, a branch of the government which is dedicated to uh, innovation. Uh, they are supporting programs of uh, innovation and industry collaboration in about uh, 1.5 million billion shekels. Uh, I'm not going to go into the way they calculate this index, but I think the message is that uh, we're shifting from a startup nation into some more mature companies, which is a good sign from the government. Uh, so the startup uh, graph is starting to kind of uh, not grow so fast, and you can see that the established companies uh, graph is uh, building up. Um, Going to the OECD, Science and Technology and Industry Scoreboard for 2017, you can see Israel, sorry for, for probably you can see it bigger there, but uh, Israel is leading, has been, uh, been leading from uh, 2005. A uh, few numbers that I took from this uh, source which are very significant. First is the fact that we have uh, uh, the highest ratio of R&D expenditure uh, uh, to GDP, 4.5%, uh, very vibrant uh, uh, VC community, and also interesting that uh, almost 10% of the R&D is actually performed by young companies, which is companies which are five years or less. Um, so that's overall giving you um, the Israeli ecosystem current uh, situation. Uh, there are a few challenges that we are facing, uh, and I already mentioned one of them. The first one is the fact that we are very heavily uh, uh, focused on the ICT sector, uh, and uh, about 70% of uh, total investment uh, goes to that sector. The second uh, issue is the gender uh, uh, bias. Uh, more men are hired in that sector. And the third one is the fact that it's actually concentrated in the middle of the country or the center of the country and not going into the peripheral areas. Uh, the Israeli government is seeking to, to actually mitigate that, uh, implementing several programs, but the aim is to actually build new ecosystem drivers or new, new uh, sectors that will lead uh, Israel. Uh, Artificial intelligence is of some, uh, one of the first ones that come in mind. Uh, healthcare, health tech is the second one that comes in line. Uh, there's a lot of effort being put into uh, geographical uh, spread, so investments go uh, to the rural areas. And also implementing the technology, new technologies in the day-to-day -day life in a proof of concept uh, programs which the government started to implement this year uh, actually adopting new technologies with a uh, very, very easy regulatory path going forward. So this actually enables uh, uh, new companies and startups to, to do proof of concept uh, with the government, which is great for them. Uh, another interesting uh, insight, uh, again, I, I'm relying on uh, Startup Nation Central source, which is uh, a, a, a non-for-profit organization, and the IIA. You can see the most uh, uh, growing sectors in Israel currently, uh, both in terms of uh, uh, funding and number of companies creation, or the, the growth of, of, uh, in the number of companies. Uh, artificial intelligence is indeed uh, leading. You can see also uh, fintech, uh, digital health, cyber, uh, transportation, and uh, industry point, uh, 4.0. Uh, I just want to also mention that Israel used to be an agriculture country, so ag tech is a big thing in Israel, uh, and I think it's going to grow. Uh, quantum computing is also missing from the here and probably is is not yet uh, emerging, but uh, we, we see a lot of uh, investment uh, currently in the, uh, in, in, in the academia and also starting to see some startups in that area. 
As I've said, uh, the Global uh, uh, Competitive Index from the World Economic Forum, and these days it's, uh, it's, it's nice to look at this. And obviously, as you can see, uh, Switzerland is the first, uh, United States second, and Israel is 16, uh, which is a big improvement for Israel. And if we dive into this, uh, with, uh, and actually it is based on 12 pillars, one of the pillars is innovation, and if you go into the innovation pillar, there's the uh, uh, industry, uh, university industry collaboration. And here you can see that Switzerland and the United States and Israel are taking the first three places. So obviously the message is that uh, technology transfer is key and it's really a big driver of innovation. Uh, and this brings me to the question of, uh, of excellence in, in academia, and uh, I just, uh, as I've said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to present some, some of the information about the Weizmann Institute. Uh, just to give you a perspective, the Weizmann Institute is a very small basic research institute, uh, 250 principal investigators, uh, altogether 4,000 people. Uh, the Weizmann started off uh, 60 years ago, uh, sorry, 70 years ago. So uh, it's a young, uh, basic research institute uh, focused on excellence. Uh, the most significant number is, the, I think, the success rate in the ERC programs, which is very high uh, and really resembles the, uh, or proves the uh, excellence of our scientists. Uh, you can see the Israeli prize uh, and the other prizes uh, and the total of publication. Um, there are many ways to measure excellence. Uh, one of them is the Leiden ranking, and again, the, the, uh, here I just want to show the increase in the Weizmann position and the fact that Weizmann uh, is now uh, on the top, top 10 uh, uh, ranking. The Leiden is the ranking measures the, in, the impact of publication, uh, so it is really covering the excellence of, of the uh, output of the campus. Uh, another uh, index that uh, was published, I think, a couple of years ago was the uh, Nature Index of uh, Innovation. And here is the uh, uh, actually measuring the impact or the citation of uh, our publication in third party patents. And again, I think this shows the relevance of, of our patents uh, in the industry and the fact that they are being cited. So, uh, as I've said, I'm going to focus on the life science sector. Uh, just to give you a very broad uh, overview of this, this sector, this sector is quite evenly divided between pharma, uh, medical devices, and digital health. Uh, we believe that uh, digital health is going to become a much stronger army in the future, and we've, we've seen a, a significant investment now by the government of uh, about one billion shekels in this area of digital health. Um, the reason that we believe that uh, this uh, uh, life science sector is going to grow is the fact that we have a very strong scientific infrastructure. Uh, we're number one uh, in uh, PhD per capita, number three in patents per capita. 33% uh, of, of our uh, students are actually life science students, and about 50% of all publications in Israel are in the life science. So life science is, should be very strong in Israel and hasn't kept caught up yet uh, to, its, uh, I mean, to its promise. Um, what are the challenges that this sector is really uh, having these days? So I think the main challenge is currently the fact that we don't have any anchor companies. Uh, Israel uh, don't have a pharmaceutical company that is, was really rooted and, and built in Israel. Uh, like in other countries in Europe uh, where uh, the, the small pharma uh, is growing up. Uh, Teva is, is a pharmaceutical company, but it's, I should remind everyone that it started off as a generic one, and it's still a very much generic company, so, uh, and it's the only company in Israel. Um, there's the late funding, uh, late stage funding, which is actually missing. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, the fact that human, we, we, we lack human capital or human resources uh, in really developing uh, strong pharmaceutical companies in Israel. So uh, as Mary said, they, they have everything in, in, in Stanford. I mean, they have 
money and the, the human resources, we lack them. Uh, government is looking into that and actually is kind planning to start a program here to try and get this sector moving. So uh, what is planned? Uh, some incentives to uh, uh, multinationals company, uh, like the incentives were, that were given to Intel, uh, which brought Intel heavily into Israel. I think the idea is to try and find, match new, new multinationals that will, are willing to come into Israel. Uh, and building a second biotech incubator, um, bank loans and money from the government to small startups and companies and also research, uh, translational research to support this uh, uh, creation of, 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 of new companies in this area uh, and recruitment of talents from abroad uh, on a permanent or, or, uh, or non-permanent basis to help uh, actually support the industry and get experts that really can bring the uh, companies to the level that they should be. In the life science sector, I think one of the most promising and interesting uh, areas is actually the personal, uh, uh, personalized medicine or personalized health uh, uh, aspect. Uh, Israel is, is well, very, very well positioned in, in that respect and should, should be a lead, leader in the world. Uh, we have a very strong health healthcare uh, system. Uh, a leading position in the world in, uh, in ICT. Uh, we have a great uh, rich uh, electronic records very from the 80s. A lot of them are diverse uh, genetically, so it's a great source for research and for uh, development and scientific excellence. So this really can bring up, uh, could be a next uh, uh, sector that in, or subsector that can push the, the industry forward. And just to give you a, a small taste from uh, what we're doing at the Weizmann Institute, uh, I'm, uh, I just want to share with you the story about the personalized uh, nutrition project. Uh, this project started off a few years ago in two labs at the Weizmann Institute, uh, the lab of uh, Professor Segel and Professor Elinav. Uh, they came up to our office or to our company seven years ago with their first uh, disclosure I remember the face of the uh, patent manager who said this is never going to be a patent and we're never going to license it. Uh, never say never. Uh, so they actually uh, got a, a thousand people and they started to collect data from their uh, microbiota uh, stool and uh, also uh, measure their uh, glucose level and also other parameters. So it's a huge database that is really very rich. Out of that database, they uh, devised an algorithm that can predict uh, the glycemic response uh, to different intakes of food, and they actually can uh, tailor or personalize uh, a diet for each person based on their microbiota. Uh, so they have a product that was developed really fairly quickly, uh, and uh, they raised uh, more than 17 million, currently raising more money, and a product out there in the market, very, very popular in Israel currently, uh, going now abroad to, uh, to the States. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, I think, is one example of, of, of digital uh, technology and, uh, and the fact of and, and utilizing some of our advantages and really building something that can impact health of people because this application is really very strong in controlling glycemic response and helping uh, pre-diabetic and diabetic people as well as normal people to keep their weight. So uh, with that, uh, thank you, and uh, I'm looking forward for the panel. this round table. Thank you very much, Mary and Gil, for this uh, uh, very inspiring speeches. It was really interesting to listen and to you and to learn more about your institution, um, which are models.
for innovators and innovation. But first, as today we are celebrating UDTech's 20th anniversary, I'd like to ask our two um, Swiss panelists um, how they consider that Lake Geneva's innovation ecosystem has changed or evolved during these two last decades. You've got microphones here on mine. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a bit okay. embarrassed to, yep. to talk about this next to Patrick uh, Ebicher, who's been one of the makers of the, of the Health Valley in the Lemanic uh, area. But uh, I think what has changed over the last 20 years is, um, well, the coming of the digital age and this convergence of the biotech, the medtech, and the infotech, and, and therefore a new uh, kinds of uh, innovation, but also new processes for, for uh, uh, technology transfer, because those innovations uh, have evolved significantly in their nature. And Patrick? Um, you know, it's my personal experience, maybe for people to know, I, I was spent you know, 10 years at Brown University. I was a Swiss postdoc going over there, knew nothing about it, never heard about it. And Sunday, one guy knocked at my door, it was a venture capitalist called, uh, from Mayfield Fund, uh, called Mark Levin, who is now well known into the venture uh, community. And he said, I want to do a company with you. I didn't know what he was talking about. But uh, anyhow, four years after, we did an IPO on the NASDAQ. And that's really how I've learned, you know, from a faculty standpoint, how to do this. And then I came back in 92 here in this country, um, you know, and I thought it was an exciting thing. And uh, I was working on the Lausanne the Hospital, the Shuv, it started another company, and then, my God, uh, it was difficult to convince our colleague, the rector, nobody knew what we were doing. Uh, I was put on a trial literally one day uh, uh, because I was doing something strange called a startup. And, and really, and, and the, the, the primary objective of, our, of my colleague was to know, you know how much money I was going to make personally. So anyhow, to make a long story short, you know, we did an IPO on the Swiss stock market, and it was very difficult. <laughs> so, so, you know, and now I look at it, and then I became president of EPFL in 2000, and, you know, I remember at the time, looking at the numbers, it was two to three million investment per year in, uh, in startups. And those last couple of years, it has always been over 100 million, and we've reached 400 million, I think 300 million last year. So, and I think I agree with, you know, the amount of venture cap that is invested in the company is a good criteria to look at how much the intensity of your activity. And what has changed? First, the people. Uh, and I think the students, I do remember also when I started as president, and, you know, the class say, who wanted to make a company? I had two or three hands, brave people. And the last year I was president when I stepped down in 2016, about a third of the people lifted their hand, which means that culturally this has changed. And, you know, and, and, and this is a key thing. Now, we're still a, we have a long way to go compared to the standards and so on. And if you look at it, maybe we'll talk later. What is missing? The idea is as good as, and we see the rankings and the RCs and, the, you know, we are at par in Europe. You know, we, we produce as much top research than our colleagues in the States. So it's not a lack of good scientists. Uh, money is around. It was not around a couple of years ago. Yeah. Some of the venture money and so on. You know, I've created now, I stepped down my own fund. We've raised 300 million in, in less than a year. So you can do, I'm chairing the Novartis Venture Fund, which is a one billion fund. So, you know, money is around. There's nothing. What we're missing most is the entrepreneurs today. It's people that know how to grow the companies. Yeah. So today, the problem in, in Europe, in Switzerland, it's the postdoc of Professor X. With some time, people can grow, but the majority don't. In Stanford, in Boston, you have people that have done it. They've done an IPO, they've done an NMA, they've done a lot of those things. So you'd rather give your company in the hands that people that know. And I think that's what. So there is a route, there, I think there is a solution to that, is to bring back the entrepreneurs. That's what we did at EPFL from the faculty. I recruit a couple of P faculty from Stanford, from MIT, and so on. The typical European that want to come back. And I think what we have to do is a returnee program for all the entrepreneurs. The people have been in the Silicon Valley and Boston, they have gone uh, uh, into, into the, you know, they've done, they've, they've developed a company, they did an IPO and so on. They left, they're ready, and I think we have to attract them back. So I think that, now there are and a lot how, of other things. How can we attract them back? You know, Europe is not a bad place to live, and Switzerland is okay. 
So, and then Lake of Geneva is even better. So, so, so I think, you know, we have a lot of assets. And I think that's what we did at EPFL. You know, I was hunting in the top U.S. school to try to bring back because I would do the same thing. You know, I was at, uh, I was at Brown. I was offered in Dutch at MIT and so on. But, you know, I was missing goat cheese opera and things like this, you know. Mm -hmm. Providence, Rhode Island is not the, you know, it's wonderful Brown, but, you know, in terms of city, it might be a little bit different. Yeah, the, the San Francisco opera is okay. So, but, but, you know, if you go to Nebraska whatsoever, you know, it's less attractive. So I think this kind of European lifestyle and so on, you know, when you have kids, mid-age, you say, do you want them to become American or do you want to come back? A lot of us, at least from the Swiss, yeah. is a great thing. But even if you're Greek, if you're Italian, if you're at Stanford, it's difficult to go back to, uh, you know, nothing against the Italian university. But there are very few places in Europe where you could come back if you're in the top schools. And I think both, you know, ETH Zurich, EPFL, University of uh, Geneva, Zurich, and so on, but also the Max Planck, and so there are very few places. But Switzerland, and I'm not talking about Israel, which is a totally different ecosystem, uh, but, but, but I think Switzerland is a fantastic place to get people back. So we were able to do it on the uh, faculty, what we need to do is to do it on the entrepreneurial. So we need to set up this returnee program for entrepreneurs. Well, thank you. Um, Antoine, what elements from the Silicon Valley or Israel could or should inspire um, most for the Swiss innov innovation ecosystem? Is there any elements which are more important, do you think, than others? Well, I think bo both situations show the strengths of ecosystems. Now, obviously, the, the history is quite different. You know, uh, in, in, in the Silicon Valley, there was a sort of a co-creation of an ecosystem between academia and entrepreneurs, and that's exactly what uh, what Patrick was mentioning. You know, we need to 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 be able to to recreate or to engineer the, the, this kind of of uh, of uh, connivence of of uh, wanting to work together. And, and this is a big challenge, especially in, 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 the, in, in the domain of, uh, of uh, medical and health and biotech, uh, where a, lo a lot of the innovators have positions in universities or in hospitals, uh, they have ideas, uh, but don't know or don't want to leave their positions to become entrepreneurs. And so one of the uh, ideas that is currently being trialed with the, with the uh, genius uh, uh, set up here in Geneva is trying to mix and or to match entrepreneurs with innovators that who bring the idea but are not uh, available or willing or, or uh, able to, to, to bring it uh, to a level where it can actually be valued. So this, this really this uh, articulation between entrepreneurship and uh, innovation in uh, academia or in the hospitals is, is something that uh, obviously we can learn from, from the success that you're, that you're mentioning. The, what, what, I, what I learned from, from, from the Weizmann and the, 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 the Yeda uh, um, uh, approach is that uh, even though you're missing large um, biotech or pharma industry, uh, you are able to be extremely innovative through excellence, through uh, using uh, I, um, information technology and also making use, and I think that that's one of the, the, the strengths of, of the ecosystem, of available data uh, that comes from the health system. That's something that we definitely need to, to learn how to do. We're trying to do this now with the electronic uh, uh, patient record and setting up infrastructures where we can actually value this, this data and use it as a way to learn, as a way to innovate. So those are two uh, lessons that I just learned from your presentation, and thank you. Thank you. Patrick, would you like to add something? You know very well Silicon Valley and, of course, here. Yeah, in our new fund, we, we're based yeah. in Woodside. You know, we have one part really of the, uh, the Stanford, people yeah. in Woodside, mm -hmm. and the other one is now at EPFL. And it's very interesting, again, to compare. So it's true, you know, but, but you know, Stanford is the ultimate. <laughs> it's the best, you know, certainly in this system. Now, I will say, we say United States, and I hear a lot. I said, again, I have nothing about Nebraska, but if you're in Nebraska, or even, you know, there are very few places. When you take out the Boston and the Bay Area, the United States is not a very great place to be. Now, there are a couple of other areas in New York and so on, but if you're talking about biotech uh, and even IT, it's, it's so, so we always compare ourselves to something which is, you know, 
the, the Bay Area is about Switzerland as a whole, and it concentrates all those people that come. So, so this is something that we have to keep in mind in size-wise and so on. So we talk about the Achlemanic, you know, we're barely one million people living here. So it's quite remarkable already what, what is present. I think what we have to do is to choose the area the way we, we think we can, you know, make a difference. And, and, you know, so if you're taking biotech, certainly life science, it's also, I, I know the, the Israeli system quite well. And, and, you know, and I'm very admirative about, you know, the startup nation, just one number, you know, it's about the venture amount invested in Israel is about five, million, five billion a year, and Switzerland is one billion, and we have a similar uh, a population of about eight million. So, now Israel has all this high tech, about 10%, but then they're lacking, yeah, you know, as you were saying, in the life science, you don't have the giants, because even in Silicon Valley, they, 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 offer, they know Basel extremely well, because but they're looking to be bought. <laughs> by those, you know, the Roches and the Novartis and the Nestle's in food and so on. We have those giants, which this is something, an asset that we have. We have great university. We have very good, you know, something very important with the undervalue, which is not, again, the, in Israel, the, the, the high-tech SMEs, you know. In Switzerland, is one of the most powerful things that we have. But we, were, we had great university, but we were missing this link, okay? Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, we're catching up quite well and quite rapidly. So I would say I'm very optimistic about the future of this country compared to where we were 20 years or 30 years ago when Unitech was created. I remember those discussions. We were in the Stone Age. But here we are, you know, 20 or 30 years after, you know, we shouldn't be ashamed of what we're doing. Now, we still have a lot of things to, to learn. We have a couple of structural problems compared. I think one of the things is the exit strategy, so it's okay for M&As, but if you want to go uh, uh, an IPO, this is not only a Swiss problem, it's a European problem. You know, the NASDAQ is still the place to go. It's very complicated. You have, you know, some of our companies at EPFL went on the NASDAQ, but you know, it is a different issue, you know, if you're not part of the, the ecosystem and so on. So I think exit strategy is something that we have to work on. Euronex and those kind of, you know, small stocks, and are, you don't know, we don't have the kind of buyers that you like to have. Uh, we're missing a little bit of the large venture groups. I think a lot of our VCs were too small in the tens of millions, you need in the hundreds of millions if you go to life science. But the asset that we have, for example, have the pharma, not the buyers, but if you, want, if you have those CEOs, you also need to have people that can build the company, you know, the working bees. Yeah, that's and there are lots of them in Basel, in life, in life science, or even if you go, I have to be careful what I'm saying but as, because I have a lot of conflict of interest there. But being a board member of Nestle and Lonza, uh, you know, Nestle, if you want to go, uh, there's a lot of working bees in Nestle that can be part of those startups in, in food and so on. So those kind of things we have, I think we're in a terrific situation. But I think we still, you know, there are a couple of structural issues about stock taxation and so on. But those are not, you know, they're important, but they're big fixed. But again, it's this guy who strikes me when I go to where I'm in Silicon Valley. You know, they have great ideas, but they know how to sell it. <laughs> you know, so they oversell. Mm -hmm. So for example, in our venture fund, I cut 50% of what the Americans say, and I add 10% of what the Swiss say, and I get a good mixture, you know, because they have, and us, you know, we have, but we're too Swiss. We, we don't overpromise. <laughs> we don't like. We'd rather, you know, you say 100, you say I'm going to deliver uh, 80, but I know that I can deliver 120, and the Americans are a bit the opposite, you know. And, and the Israeli are closer to the Americans than they are, you know, to, to the Swiss. So I think we have to learn to be a little more, you know, uh, uh, aggressive. And the other thing is, you know, we should, what is missing here is to say this, you're going to make it a great, you're going to make big. You know, people tend, because of the comfort, we see a lot of the EPFL startup are great, but they bought too early, they acquired, because, you know, the CEO says, okay, I did okay, I did a 3X, 4X, well, okay. So, so but you have in, in Silicon Valley, we still have a couple of here, but saying, I'm going to change the world, you know, I'm going to make this company and so on. Well, that's a question of culture. I mean, yeah, not the same question. thing for everything. I mean, it's not No, no, but sure, but this is where I think, <laughs> when I see the entrepreneurs in the U.S., the way they sell and so on is, is you know, much more confident. Mm -hmm. We're a bit shy. Our, it, yeah. our entrepreneurs are a little bit shy. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we have to have this kind of confidence. 
This is being fixed partially because we have a lot of foreign students, and that's the most important. We see a lot of, in our startups, it's often the foreigners mm -hmm. that have the kind of ability to do it. So I think that's why it's so important to keep the, you know, our country open. Of course, yes. Now a question to all. Um, with a global village and globalization and everything, do you think that the different innovation ecosystems will be more and more similar and will tend to be identical? Or on, on the opposite, do you think that they will keep their own specificities? So perhaps Mary and Gil? And then, of course, Antoine and Patrick. That's actually a really interesting question because because I am in Silicon Valley and we have very strong personalities and we oversell. Um, I'm not sure how open people in Silicon Valley are to being different than they are today. They're going to have to change. They can't sustain things the way, they, well, maybe they can. Um, I think that they're definitely, one thing that might happen is right now the VC really like to invest in local companies. And I'm thinking that over time they'll be less likely to restrict themselves that way. So in that sense, I mean, the Bay Area is already overcrowded and there's no place to live. So they're going to have to do something. So I think that'll be one way that they'll look to the outside, to other places, um, to try and affect the cultures, you know, the micro, the ecosystem there by investing in other places. Okay, thank you. Again? It's a, a kind of a philosophic question. Should we want them to be the same? And I think we don't want them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think they grow uh, to be the same. So uh, it's a kind of a evolution process that is being for each ecosystem. So if you look at the Boston area, you can see definitely the way that it evolved as compared to other areas like the Bay Area or the New York effort now to build a, a, an ecosystem in the life science. Uh, so I, I think the ecosystems are uniquely to their areas. It, it's good to look around and understand what people are doing, what's the rationale, and how you can implement it in your own environment. But uh, I, I don't believe they will be the same. I, I truly don't think so. And it's good that uh, they will be different. I think so too. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And, and uh, you have to find where you have a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. So I think for Switzerland, it's certainly all the life science because we have those big players, certainly in the pharma, in the food, but also in the med tech. And I think in life science, we'll see more and more convergence of those technologies. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's something about the Swiss DNA. We're good at doing small things, complex and reliable. And I think when you look at you know, brain implant, those kind of things that needs really this kind of thing, this corresponds really to our DNA. So I think that's one of the areas that I think we can be very competitive. The other one is not Switzerland, even though it's Switzerland, I think but this is my latest pet project, which is the art. <laughs> So I think there's a new area in art tech yeah. culture. If we have all those robots and so on, I think we will have to nurture our brain. And I think we'll have to entertain our brain. And, and I think there, if you, we were on this crazy project, the Venice time machine and so on. So, you know, I always say, you know, uh, uh, you know Venice is unique. <laughs> you know, uh, San Antonio, is not the same as Venice, even though they call it the Venice of the US. So the culture is something very much so. We see a lot of startups relate to culture being in Paris, in Milan, in Berlin, and so on. So I think an area like this would be something quite specific for Europe. So I think, again, you will see the way we do it, and I think it's important that we have each our own culture, ecosystem, but also the area. And I think for Switzerland, I'm not saying that the other ones are not, but certainly the life science is a very obvious one. We should do it in fintech, but we don't do as much. But you know, we'll never be like Israel in terms of the ICT mm. and security and cyber, because the context <laughs> people live, this is survival. So you know, you look at the impact of the army, even also in the States, in DARPA, the Swiss army is okay, but you know, <laughs> it will not have the same kind of investment. And Antoine, what do you think? And if, if for the Switzerland, as, as Patrick said, which speci sorry, with specificities should we develop here or insist more? 
Well, I think there are, there are different uh, setups in Switzerland. Uh, uh, I think uh, clearly in the Lemanic, uh, in the Lemanic uh, region, uh, the domain of uh, health tech, biotech, uh, and health IT is definitely one of the, one of the key domains where, where we should be investing for, for, for many reasons. Um, in terms of concentration of, uh, of stakeholders, whether it's uh, companies, it's the academia, it's the large hospitals, it's an aging population, it's you know, lots of good reasons to actually uh, in, in invest in, the, in, in this domain. And then there are other uh, domains of excellence. Uh, I, I see Professor Gisin and the, uh, you know, uh, all, the, all the quantum computing and quantic uh, technologies. Uh, I think our link with, as, as, as Patrick said, the, the, the ability to create uh, microelectronics and, and quality things. The, the only thing the army has produced is probably the Swiss army knife, but there are lots of other examples of very fine mechanics and very fine uh, uh, devices uh, that also connect to, 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 to the health domain. Uh, and probably further uh, east uh, of Switzerland, we, we have more of the fintech, of the uh, crypto things that probably will play uh, an interesting role as well. But uh, I, I, as we said, you know, ecosystems are, are quite local, not only in their, in, their, in their culture, but also in the politics involved. Uh, just like natural ecosystems, just like the Great uh, Barrier Reef is very sensitive to global warming, or as the you know, Amazon ecosystem, very different, but very sensitive to deforestation. Uh, we need to be very careful also on how uh, we can make those ecosystems grow and sustain. And it's not just a question of culture, I think. It's not just a question of money, it's also a question of politics, of uh, visionary uh, uh, leaders and, and, and support. Thank you. Um, we are lucky enough to have Switzerland, United States and Israel, the three top rankings as, as we saw previously here. But th we can see that there are um, new and emerging ecosystems uh, in Europe and well, in other places, but in Europe like Bucharest, Lisbon, Tallinn. So what do you think? Do you think that this new uh, ecosystem will be more and more competing with the traditional one? What's, what's your opinion on that? I don't know who would like to marry, Gail, everybody? No? <laughs> I think of the difference between Europe and the United States, you have more concentration in the United States. It's very clear that the Bay Area, the, you know, uh, the Boston area, now maybe the New York, uh, in Europe, you'll have smaller but more dispersed. It's the same way for universities and so on. So you have smaller hubs, but that we need to connect. So you do will not have only three hubs, you know, because the French will want to have one, so you know, the German, the Italian will want to have one, and so on. So, so, but I think the key thing, they will be aggregating around the top university, but as it was very well said by Mary, it's, you know, at the end, it's, uh, it's top universities that attract those blessed places. If you don't have, and same thing in, in Israel, if you don't have world-class research university, you don't have, at least in deep tech, which is, you know, there are a lot of different startups and so on. But if you're talking deep tech, this is very clearly. So when you look at Europe, there are less places, you know, certainly the UK and Switzerland on, you know, on, in, in Europe. Israel, in Europe, as part of the European system, you know, when you look at the ERCs, it's very clear. I think none of the top 10 Universities that attract the most ERC are either British, Swiss, or Israeli. So, so it says a lot about you know the capacity to to attract those. Because at the end, if you, you know the discoveries are and the, the really disruptive discoveries are happening in top universities, like it or not, because that's where you you gather the best brains and the most innovative brains. So the most important thing, if you are, but you have, you know if you're Portugal, it's very difficult because you know you. The first thing you would have to, to build a world-class research university, and there are very few places that have the means to do it and the capacity to do it. And I think that's why. So you will see, even in France, you look culture. I said, but the other thing which France does extremely well is now anything which is related to AI and so on. Why? Because France has a very strong school of mathematics. So, so, so you know, it, and it's why probably. So I think it's intimately related to the quality of the place. And that's where you know, Switzerland and Israel as small countries, and the United States is a different issue, but it's less likely that you will see a hub in Louisiana than you're gonna see in California. You know, it's as simple as that. 
So I think the ability to develop world class is the must, the first, and most important. Then the rest comes. And that's why, at the end, you have to support basic research. Mm -hmm. And if a country doesn't support basic research with its university, it will not have it. But as Mary said, you know, there's a fantastic book on Stanford called The Cold War University, exactly describing that. And, and it's amazing that, I always give an example. Stanford was rather, as you were saying, a regional university until the 50s. And this president, this provost changed. You know, and they went and they, they, they also accepted DARPA money and so on, which totally changed the game. And I think this is, you know, certainly those Stanfords got lots amount of money. There were, by the way, there were huge debates at the time from the faculty, if you should accept DARPA money and so on. That was at the heart of, of, of Silicon Valley. So I think, you know, those are the most important. And that's why I'm very impressed with Israel, because, you know, in the context of Israel, when you, you look there, to be able to build those world-class research university, and said the Weizmann, but if you look you know, at Tel Aviv, but uh, the Hebrew, the, the, the Weizmann, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, Technion, and so on, it's amazing. And again, this is reflected by the capacity to attract the best and the brightest. Okay. Antoine, uh, uh, yeah, Gil, of course. Just to add uh, to Antoine, I think uh, you're right. I mean, the fact that uh, uh, we, as a small nation, attract, try to get the best people back. Uh, we put a lot of effort, as you said, in recruiting back or getting back uh, bright people that uh, went abroad and tried to get them to Israel. Uh, so that's in the academic level, you're right, and that's part of the excellence of the Weizmann. Uh, in the last 10, 10 years, we've recruited more than 100 new, new uh, staff members. The, the Weizmann doesn't grow. I mean, we keep 250 principal investigators. So new, new bright people, most of them, uh, had postdoc positions in top universities and could be accepted to the top uh, universities in the United States, and then they, they chose to come back to Israel and to the Weizmann just because we were able to provide the infrastructure and the support to get them back. So the brain power is, 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 is crucial, and uh, uh, we face the problem of, of the environment that we live in and the fact that Israel is not such a nice place to live, like uh, probably like Switzerland. So that's 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 also a, a barrier for attracting top talent for for the academia. So we had to we have really have to focus on our own community to to bring up these kind of uh, talents. Thank you, Antoine. Would you like to add something on the competition of new um, hubs and innovation ecosystem? Well, I think it's inevitable that uh, there are multiple uh, hubs or multiple ecosystems and that they will compete in some ways. Uh, I think one of the issues is, is not only excellence, but also getting the critical mass. And this requires probably geogra geographical proximity. Uh, and actually not only geographical in terms of kilometers, but sometimes much less than this. And I think, you know, this is a place where this has been experimented, bringing uh, two different universities in the same place. And I think we're starting to see how it's actually uh, creating new synergies, new possibilities. So I, I believe that uh, the place itself is going to be something very important to connect people at the level of people and not just, you know, sending emails or doing video conferences. So uh, places uh, will remain places. There will be many, uh, and then some will go up, some will go down. Uh, I think we've talked about the factors that are essential to their success. But I, I truly believe of, uh, the, of bringing people together in the same room or, or, or very nearby so that it becomes natural uh, to, to uh, uh, enable serendipity, creating new ideas that you don't have if you're planning to meet someone remotely. So, so th those kind of things need to be, to be architected, to be engineered. So you, all of you think that localization will still be as important as before, even with the digi digitalization and all this globalization. So, I mean, place is important. Localization is still. Yeah, still yeah. the cafeteria is still the great place to be. You know, you, you, know, you could do a lot of virtual, but at the end, it's your colleagues, it's bumping into your colleagues. Randomly, it's the graduate students, it's the kind of you know, socialization that you have around something. I still think, and that's where, where those things happen are the campuses. 
And that's why, you know, I was very envious about the top U.S. schools that have those campuses. As you know, we didn't have them in Europe. And, and I think we'd have to bring them to, you know, that's what we did, tried to develop at EPFL. But here in this building, I remember, you know, trying to buy back the building from Mexorono, putting the university and the EPFL together in the same building and so on. But I think this is essential because, you know, then the engineers, the physicists, whatever, met with the, you know, the barges, the MDs and so on. So I think creating those physical places are still, despite all those technology, is still very important. And thanks God. Mm -hmm. That it's good to 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 to, <laughs> to meet physically, and you know, we, so I think. But again, the places are very important. Now we will not have hundreds of places, and that's my worry. Even for Switzerland, for the non-Swiss, you know, there are two, you know, ETH, one EPFL, one ETH Zurich, but there's huge competition between both of them. Okay, but it's cr true that Zurich is a great place to be. So we have to be careful, and we have to <laughs> to work together. But at the same time, there's a level of competition. I think it was very important for this part of the country, the French raid part, to have this kind of drive. And I think now it's respected. Now we have to learn how to work with our Zurich colleagues and also our Basel colleagues, where, you know, certainly if you're in the biotech pharma, Basel is a, is a, is a key place. Uh, so I think, you know, we have, but I always give, you know, when you give it, you know, if you take out the Alps and the Jura, and just, uh, you know, it's about the size of Silicon Valley. When you go to San Jose, it's what's it? It's so now I think for Switzerland, we have to go from a regional, which is the Achlemannic, to a Swiss level. Mm. And I think this is going to be the next place for us to create a hub. In Europe, there will not be a thousand of those. But I think if we can get our Zurich colleague to work with us, and I think now we have the respect, because, you know, at least the statistics mm. show that there's as much if not more VC money being put in the Achlem and in Zurich. But the next step, our competition is not Zurich. You know, I think now it's the time to go and work together. Because if you put the power, you know, ETH is a good school, there's no doubt. You know, yeah. it has great faculty, it has great capabilities. So now we're at the level that we were able to do this between the university, which is not bad. You know, I think we really work well with the University yeah, of Geneva exactly. and Lausanne. Mm -hmm. Now it's time to, to, to reach to our Swiss German colleagues. Thank you. Gil and Mary, what do you think about localization? Will it be still as yeah. important? Okay. Um, I think that uh, what we see is uh, a center of excellence actually not competing only, but mm -hmm. also collaborating. So you can see, uh, I mean, Silicon Valley, a lot of Israelis go and back to, to the Israeli, to Silicon Valley and, and back to Israel. So you can see the communication between su such uh, uh, centers of excellence and the Boston area also plays uh, a, a great mod role model for us and, 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 and back forth. So I think uh, talking globally and pro probably you have to, to concentrate on, on Switzerland to get everyone together, but I think on, on a global scale, uh, you'll see competition, but also collaboration between this center of excellence, and uh, because they naturally they they're going to uh, communicate and, and and think together how they can improve. So that's that's my two cents. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know that there. I don't think that there's the competition necessarily. It just depends on what your ecosystem is like and, and trying to, um, for us, trying to compete with somebody in another ecosystem doesn't really happen. It doesn't really make sense. Um, I think that it will get easier to do things on a global level, though. I agree that you need to be located, that you can't do everything by video call, but I think that there is going to be more flexibility I could be wrong on this, for people to actually move because it might, they might decide that the things that are going on in Israel are very important and what they want to do. And there is competition amongst, obviously, companies and things in our area. Um, they might decide to come to Switzerland because, you know, there's snow, <laughs> <laughs> which is fun. Um, yeah, so I think um, there's not necessarily competition, but I think there will be a lot more, I think, moving around. Thank you. And Antoine, would you like to say something about that? Well, I, I think globalization enhanced the ability to collaborate uh, at larger, larger distances and, and larger bandwidth. And that's one aspect. And the other is uh, the creativity 
uh, the, that requires co-construction and, and collective intelligence, and that probably still requires some some concentration and, and physical proximity. So I, I think we, we we need to understand how we can use both in order to create those those creative uh, uh, and and you know s sizable uh, ecosystems that can make a difference. So so I think we will you know it's this localization kind of a kind of thing you know think local work local but but in in a, in a globalized world thank you well we've got still a few minutes so i'd like to open the discussion to the public um who would like to ask the first question yes so there's so please if you can just give your name and try to be as short as possible so that we've got a chance to hear some Benedict other questions Hench from geneva uh, this distinguished panel did not mention a word about Asia. Where do you uh, globalize uh, research? Thank you. Who would like to answer first? No, it's, it's clear uh, that Asia is, is going to be... In terms of universities, it's very interesting. Uh, you see the Chinese going up but in mass, but not yet you know, to the quality of the top. But they, it's only a question of time, no doubt. Uh, what you've seen from an academic, point, point, uh, academic standpoint, it's more the small countries. Certainly, uh, Singapore has been able to create a couple of you know, world-class research universities. Korea. Korea is probably the most impressive. Uh, so you will see a couple. Okay? Now, in terms of the VC investment, it's very interesting. Because a lot of the Chinese now come onto the market, a lot in the US, in fact. And that's going to be very interesting to see what is happening with this new administration. A lot of the LPs, for example, even of the big fund, is Chinese money. And what will happen here is it's just fascinating to know if they're going to maintain or, 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 or change. They're doing some quite big investment in, in, in China per se. For example, uh, the, the, the top fund in Singapore now has shifted their investment uh, uh, the, uh, towards China, so so there's no doubt that this is happening, uh, and that's going to be a major shift. Now, so on, on, I think to say it paradoxically, they're more advanced in the financial uh, uh, component than they are because it takes a little more time to build, you know, top university. You don't decrete like this that you're going to make it, but certainly uh, this will happen. And I think, of course, China is the number one. The other countries are doing well and small, but you know, to tr for example, in Singapore, they've done it in life science. I have to be careful because I'm on the advisory board of the Prime Minister of Singapore for life science, but it's, it's, they've tried the pharma and they didn't realize how complex it is to, to do the pharma. So they're withdrawing a little bit, but they're gonna go more into med tech and so on. So there will be some adaptation uh, but it's clear uh, that, that some of those will be. But again, it's going to be related to the quality of the institution that they've been to create. And I think it's going to, thanks for us, we may have 10 or maybe at best 20 years until China, until the, 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 the Zhao Tong, the, uh, the Tsinghua and so on will be at the level of our top universities. Uh, I think uh, the, f the East is, uh, is certainly a challenge and an opportunity also. And uh, we've been looking into China for a few years, always going back and forth. We've seen changes there. I mean, the fact that uh, the Chinese market is, is uh, I mean, five years ago, they, they were really uh, non-innovative uh, approach. They, they, they were trying to do uh, Me Too drugs or something like that, but not more than that. Uh, and we see now uh, f more and more companies which are really true innovative uh, companies. Uh, so I think uh, they're getting there and I agree that it's a cultural change that needs to take part. Uh, higher education needs to catch up. But uh, definitely, uh, I think we shouldn't uh, stay on, on, I mean, off guard. And we probably should uh, look into China and, and, and collaborate because uh, China is going to be a very strong uh, component in, in the future for, for sure. And not to mention also India, which is also a, a very, very uh, interesting country in terms of uh, 
uh, the quality of, of, of science in some, in some areas and uh, the ability to really uh, grow things there. Uh, mentality is, is, a, is, a, is a challenge always uh, in, in these countries. So um, we're still puzzled. I mean, we're, we're go my CFO is just returning now from, from China, looking into some opportunities, and uh, we haven't made the decision or the strategic decision to really put a footprint in, in China, which is a big, big step for us to, to really think of. Thank you. I could really only agree with two of the points that were made. One is that um, in China, they've become a lot more innovative. That was one of the big things we didn't um, really see years ago. And um, the other that in a lot of the countries, um, getting higher quality um, research is going to be important. And as you said, that's happening in some countries already. But in our interactions uh, are fairly minimal still um, with the uh, countries in Asia. Well, the University of Geneva has uh, signed a, a pretty ambitious uh, collaboration with the Tsinghua University. Uh, and, and, and that's really a learning experience in many uh, dimensions. Uh, and clearly, we, we can learn from each other. We have now summer schools and students from China coming to work, staying several months working with our students. We now also have our students uh, going to, to, to Tsinghua University. Uh, I think that's the only way we can make progress is really by knowing each other, knowing the differences, but also uh, learning. Learning, and, and uh, I think we we, uh, we 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 really need to 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 increase this kind of partnerships as a way to to, to widen our understanding of, of the evolution of of, uh, of the world. Well, thank you very much for you and. And luckily, I think we have to <laughs> leave the floor. So thank you again. And of course, afterwards, you, you will be able to ask every question you want when we will drink something. So I think you saw uh, you know, everybody here, so you can ask them questions as we have to leave the floor. Thank you very much. And Laurent, the floor is you. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much for this discussion and there will be more time after for the aperitif. Uh, it's time before finishing off a very important element of this conference is to also reward um, the best or the most promising invention that we found in 2018 and also the most impactful spin-off. So we have four awards we would like to show uh, and give tonight. We will start with the most impactful spin-off, and I would like, before we call the first uh, awardee, to just send the video for the first award. Thank you. Novimune's success story is very exciting for Unitech for several reasons. First, Novimune was created in 1998, the same year as Unitech, and it was one of the very first licenses negotiated by Unitech, so it holds a special place in the heart of Unitech. And then Novimune um, stayed very, very close to the University of Geneva for the past 20 years, recruiting much of its staff out of the university labs and having many interactions and collaborations with university researchers. So we are thrilled uh, by the huge amount of expertise that Novimune has built and the number of jobs that it has created uh, locally here in Geneva. And then, of course, Novimune is special uh, in that it has, is the first University of Geneva spin-off that has had a drug approved by the FDA. So Novimune is a great role model for our spin-offs and we hope that many will follow in its tracks. Novimune was founded by Professor Bernard Marx based on his research in immunology that he conducted at the University of Geneva Medical School for over 20 years. So the goal of the company was to transform this knowledge into something useful for patients, uh, specifically into drugs for immune-related and inflammatory diseases like therapeutic monoclonal antibodies. We've always been very close to the University of Geneva, so in our first years, uh, even geographically, because we were located just across the street from the Geneva University Hospital, and then later on when we had to move to Plan Le Wat because of space constraints, we continued to be very close to the University of Geneva through numerous collaborations with different people and different groups. And uh, this ongoing working relationship with the University of Geneva continues to be very important for us even today. 
Hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, or HLH, is a disorder of immune regulation where one's own immune cells become overactivated and attack, attacks one's own uh, body organs, inducing damage. A form of HLH, primary or familial HLH, often occurs in young, very young children, and if left untreated, is fatal. Interferon gamma is a potent cytokine of immune cell activation, has been shown to be involved in HLH. Imipalimab is a blocking interferon gamma antibody, which was developed for the treatment of primary HLH. The preclinical and translational studies performed at Novimune validated the use of imipalimab in primary HLH, and an innovative clinical trial design allowed for the approval of imipalimab by the FDA in 2018 for the treatment of primary HLH. And indeed, as of January 1st, 2019, Imipalimab, now known as Gamifant, is commercialized in the US for the treatment of HLH. In order to discover antibodies, therapeutic antibodies such as uh, Imipalimab, we've been using over the years quite a number of technologies. We also work quite hard to develop our own technologies to make better antibodies. What I think is really nice is that we've also been able to transfer some of these technologies to the University of Geneva so that scientists can use them for their own research. In more recent years, we've been focusing on the development of bispecific antibodies. So a bispecific antibody is able to engage two different targets with the two different arms so that it opens up novel therapeutic modalities, novel op options for patients. And to be honest, we're quite excited about it. Nicola Fischer from Novimun to receive the most impactful spin-off prize. Just, uh, so I think Nicola and I, we go along very far and I'm very glad to see that Novimun did such a good job. So do you want to say a few words just? Absolutely, yeah, with pleasure. Yeah, so I mean, obviously it's been a, it's a great time for Unitech and uh, we were born more, more or less at the same time. So it's also a special time for, for Novimun. You know, many ups and downs, many, you know, uh, as, as in the life of every startup. I think, as you heard, was very special for us is being able to bring a molecule from the intellectual conception all the way through discovery to clinical trials, manufacturing, everything that goes along to bring uh, actually now a therapy for patients for a fatal disease. So we're obviously very proud of it. We're celebrating that. Uh, we had also many, you know, a number of failures. Uh, it's difficult to make drugs. And now we're really moving towards, you know, a kind of an next generation format with bispecific. And, you know, I'm not sure it shows really in the video, but actually we're really excited about these possibilities to make these bispecific antibodies. So, uh, well, you know, I mean, like, you know, we celebrate the, this prize as well. So thank you very much for this recognition, for the help over the years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicolas, and thank you, Novimun. <laughs> and we'll uh, have a second spin-off, Most Impactful. Please send the video. The long-lasting relationship between ID The long-lasting relationship between ID Quantique and the University of Geneva started in 2001 when Unitech received the first invention disclosure from the researchers. From there, a license agreement was put in place, which was the beginning of this long-lasting and high-quality relationship between the two organizations. The quality of the relationship comes mainly from the people. People at ID Quantique we have interacted with from the beginning of the company when it was created, and later on, new people who came always with a willingness to communicate, to exchange and be transparent. The consequence of that is that we were able to draft deals which really corresponded to the needs of the company. And that helped both organizations to follow these deals in a very efficient way. So we are very happy today to celebrate our 20 years together with ID Quantique, looking forward to a continued collaboration for many years to come. 
ID Quantic is a spin-off from the group of applied physics of the University of Geneva founded in 2001. It developed products based on quantum photonics, the science of ultra-weak light. The company benefited from the very pragmatic and efficient support from Unitech at its beginnings and it now employs about 100 employees in Geneva, in the UK, in the US and in South Korea. We have two fields of activities, the first one being quantum sensing, where we develop measurement devices that exploit the quantum proper properties of light. One example of such application is the system we've developed for Airbus in order to test the ignition system of the Ariane 6 European launcher, which will go live in July 2020. So ID Quantic's second activity is in quantum safe cybersecurity, where we sell cybersecurity products to governments and enterprises worldwide, notably quantum cryptography, which protects data communications between multiple points uh, against future attacks by a quantum computer, and quantum random number generation, which produces randomness, which is at the basis of all security products. The government market um, is a particularly interesting one. We also sell into finance, into companies with large intellectual property portfolios who need to protect their data in the long term, into critical infrastructure, etc. And in the next 10 years, as we celebrate Unitec's 30th anniversary, we hope that ID Quantic will still be the leader in quantum safe security communications with a global presence and thousands of employees. Please welcome uh, CEO of uh, ID Quantic, Grégoire Ribordi. So Grégoire also was uh, one of the first uh, spin-off of Unitech and the University of Geneva and also uh, Nicolas Gisin is here, he's a long-lasting board member of Unitech, so it's a big pleasure also for me to, to see also the very positive development of Ide Quantique and uh, it's, a, it's a huge, uh, I think, achievement that you've been able to do and if you want to say a few words also. Thank you, Laurent, maybe, yes. So as you saw, you know, quantum technology is a hard thing. You know, when you observe it, as you saw with the video, you change it and it disappears. So for us, you know, it's been tough, it's been interesting. Uh, I think we started too early in terms of technology. Laurent, you, I'm sure you saw this, but you didn't tell us. We let us try, but we managed to survive, to be agile, and to find a way to, to where we are now. Also, thanks to the collaboration with the University of Geneva and the, the pragmatic approach uh, of, of Unitech. So I think now it's really exciting what's happening in quantum technologies. We are very well positioned to grow further and you know, remain one of the leaders in this field. And um, I would like to say finally that uh, what was said in the panel, I, I agree that the, the Swiss ecosystem has changed a lot over the past 20 years. There is now you know, money, there's, uh, there are role models, examples. One thing that I think where Switzerland must still improve a little bit is in growth capital. I think it's, still, it's easy to find um, you know, seed money, the first few millions, but it's still tough for an entrepreneur to go for and find the 10, 15, 20 million that is needed to scale the company and go global. And I hope that you know, in 10 years, uh, when you, you do your next anniversary, we, we can say that this problem is solved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grégoire. It's a pleasure to see the excellence also of developing such a very complex uh, system. So now we go to the second type of awards. We thought it's also important not only to look back, but also to look forward. And so we have two awards for the most promising 2018 inventions. And I'd like to send also the, the first movie about the first of these two most promising invention awards. Unitech has been collaborating with the hospital for more than 16 years to valorize innovation. Innovation at the hospital is a very specific because most of the employees have the capacity to identify a medical need and find a solution. The solution developed by Olivier and Nicolo at the CMU is the result of a very good collaboration between fundamental research at the Faculty of Medicine and the clinic at the hospital to develop a medical device. So this project has been supported by Unitech and financed by Inocap, which is the proof of concept funding of the university and the hospital. If this technology works, it would be what we, what we call an innovation from bench to bedside. 
So a chronic wound is a wound that doesn't heal in a proper amount of time. Chronic wounds is a very serious medical situation um, and is associated with the chronic pain and sometimes require even some extreme surgical acts such as amputation. So a chronic wound develops in several pathological conditions. We can think about diabetes or uh, venous um, um, insufficiency and uh, represent uh, a real problem because of our aging population and the prevalence of this disease. So chronic wounds are also relatively frequent and uh, um, are associated with uh, increase uh, um, with the real economic and social burden. Um, we can think that in the hospital we have around 500 uh, patients that need per year um, to be uh, treated for chronic wound care. And uh, in the United States we can estimate that 4.5 million people are affected by chronic wound. A subtype of stem cells present in our body represent an attractive tool for the treatment of chronic wounds. Uh, these cells has the advantage to produce a large amount of healing factors. Based on these cells, we have decided to produce a patch uh, that will combine different components. The first component will be a sponge that is biocompatible with the patients. We have introduced the cells, the stem cells within the sponge to produce a patch secreting the sweet healing factors. And we plan now, in collaboration with the hospital, to test this patch directly in patients. Please welcome Olivier Prenasov and Nicolo Brembia. And I'd like to also say that part of the innovations that are coming through our office are resulting of a collaboration between the university and the hospital of Geneva. And I think this is a very good example. And we found very interesting also the proximity, not only of an academic center, but also of a, a center of excellence with clinicians and patients. And I think this was also very promising for us to see such a proximity. I don't know if you want to add a little things also. So thank you very much for the, the prize and thank you very much also to Unitech for the very interesting and nice discussions and the support uh, for st starting grants for us. And uh, it's the very early beginning, so let's work uh, now a lot. Yeah, so I, I want just to add that yeah, we are very proud of this prize actually. And then uh, we hope actually in 10 years to be here maybe with the other type of prize actually. <laughs> Thank you very much. And so we, we get to the last, but not the least, of this most promising invention, 2018. Please send the video. The collaboration between the Tech Transfer Office Unitech and Hans Haugemann and his team started in the early days of the office with an invention pertaining to an inor inorganic material allowing to produce discharge lamps which need, did not need uh, mercury, which was a big progress at that time. The more recent inventions from Hans's lab were the fruit of collaborations. Collaborations with EMPA mainly, but also with industries. We enjoy working with Hans a lot. Uh, we look forward to having this flow of inventions continuing to come in our office. And we most of all look forward to having his inventions benefiting the society at large. Our invention has to do with the development of the next generation of batteries, which will be needed for uh, emerging markets such as the electric vehicles or the storage of renewable energies. And for these new batteries, we need to store more energy in an even smaller volume, for example, to drive your car for uh, more kilometers. And in the current, current battery technology, uh, one of the components is a liquid, uh, the electrolyte, and this liquid is also quite flammable. So the battery requires several layers and also sealing components that add weight to the battery. 
And if we could replace that liquid by a solid, we could reduce the weight and make and pack more energy in the same volume and less weight. But making this solid electrolyte is quite challenging. And with our invention, we can prepare such a solid using first a solvent and then drying it to prepare the electrolyte, which makes the, then the assembly of the battery a lot easier. So compared to the previous method to prepare the electrolyte, where we needed to, uh, where we were using mechanical milling to mix the precursor, which could lead to some impurities and was also quite time consuming, we can now use a much cleaner uh, solvent and thus get a cleaner product in less time. This research project is a result of a combined research led by four different research groups at University of Geneva, the EMPA in Dübendorf of PSI and Willigen and the Academy of Science in Poland. So we combine both fundamental, theoretical and practical aspects to realize new battery materials, focusing on new materials for solid state battery application. In Geneva, we concentrate on more fundamental studies, while in EMPA Dübendorf, they are specializing in general on battery technology and realize prototypes with the materials we can synthesize here in Geneva. The improvement which we have achieved with the patent is in fact to solubilize our new electrolyte sodium conducting material in order to improve the contact between this material and the electrode for an improved efficiency and reproducibility of future sodium batteries. Please welcome Hans Hagemann and Leon Duchesne. I just cannot resist a small anecdote with Hans Hagemann. When I started 20 years ago, I was working also with Hans Peel, who was a professor with you. And um, the first, one of the first inventions was a mercury-free uh, neon lamp. It was mentioned by Matthias in the video. And the first way we could attract some interested party to actually discuss about licensing this invention was actually to go on, on radio and to just give a description on a very general radio. And the person was actually driving and they contacted us. So it shows that we have to be pro, kind of creative also to find ways of finding a partnership. But uh, I'd like also to, to say, and you said, there is a very good collaboration between the University of Geneva and EMPA. And I think it's also why Leon is here and is on the video, because it shows the importance of collaboration. I think Patrick said it's very important to look at Switzerland as a small village in terms of collaboration and be stronger together. I think you are a good example if you want to add, add something on that, I'm sure. Yes, well, with respect to collaboration with EMPA, well, we had a couple of years ago another patent together with EMPA and another a small company which is located in Teufen, Appenzell, so even farther away from Geneva. So the hard part of being a Geneva partner is that we have always to go there instead of their, them coming to Geneva. So anyhow, I appreciate very much the collaboration with Unitech because over the years this thing has been much more simplified because now I just phone Matthias and then I say I have an idea and then he say, okay, let's meet and discuss. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. and congratulations again. So um, we are running a few minutes late. I will be very short. There is one person I'd like to thank, it's Constance Muller, she's still here. And I wanted to just thank Constance Muller, who was really the person behind all this organization, to just benefit from this very unique element of the innovation ecosystem. So please, Connie, could you please come here and big round of applause. <laughs> It's a lot of work, and she did it beautifully. So thank you very much. I won't have time to go beyond just thanking you all to be coming tonight. There is an aperitif that's going to be served just outside when you exit the building. Before you exit, stop by the aperitif, and we will be happy to continue talking together. So thank you very much, and have a good evening.